Well, welcome to Life in the Word, and this is our last chapter of 1 Peter chapter 5. I want to thank you for joining us for this entire series on 1 Peter, and I hope that it has been an encouraging uh, journey that you've been on with your family in digging deep into a book of the Bible and uh, just diving deep into the treasure of truths that are found in this letter. I think it's been stated over and over again. This book is so relevant to where the church is right now in our times. And so we need to acquaint and immerse ourselves in the richness of this book because it will serve us and inform us and arm us and prepare us for upcoming seasons that may require us to suffer for our faith. And so we are now in the final chapter and I want to dive right in. Uh, Peter is going to conclude his letter by addressing church leadership. But before we do that, I want us to uh, just overview the journey that we've been on. And again, the context of this letter is he's addressing believers in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, that are facing a specific fiery trial. This wave of persecution that we've talked about probably each and every time that we've, we've gone through one of the individual chapters. But in this moment of trial and persecution, Peter in this letter is encouraging believers to redirect their focus from their suffering to the ultimate redemptive suffering of Christ Jesus. And so in 1 Peter 1.11, referring to the prophets and the, the spirit of Christ that was functioning in them as they prophesied of the coming days of Messiah, it says this, the spirit of Christ was in them, in these prophets, indicating when he was predicted, but also the sufferings of Christ. So these prophets could foresee that Messiah was coming, but he was going to be a suffering servant. He was going to be a suffering Messiah. So again, these believers have been enduring a specific fiery trial, but he redirects their focus and, say, and, and says to them, listen, I know that you're enduring pain. You're, you're going through a struggle. You're experiencing suffering, but Jesus, the Messiah, those that prophesied his coming, one of the specific things that they prophesied is that he would also endure suffering. Then in 1 Peter 2.21, Peter explicitly says, Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. His suffering was predicted, but it was also an example for you. Then in 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. And here he is trying to, as we taught when we were teaching on 1 Peter 3, he wasn't just saying his, his suffering is exemplary. That's true because that's what he says in 1 Peter 2. But in chapter 3, he said there is a redemptive, larger purpose behind suffering. And also when he's specifically talking about Christ, he was talking about that his suffering was for the redemption of all mankind. Then in 1 Peter 4, 1, he says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, just as you are suffering, arm yourself, prepare yourself with the same way of thinking. And, and so we know that in times of trauma and pain, the enemy is right there to sow lies and distortions into our thinking of why this suffering is happening. Why do, why do bad things happen to good people? You know, is God good? Uh, is, is, am I suffering because of something I've done wrong? And so he, he says, I want you to arm yourself with the mindset that Christ had, 
that he could see a greater glory that was coming. And so instead of reacting to the suffering and recoiling from the suffering, we learn to respond to God in the midst of it, knowing that the suffering is working something in us and through us for God's glory. Then also in 1 Peter chapter 4, 13, he says, but rejoice insofar as that you share in, in Christ's suffering. Not only do you prepare yourself to respond to God in the midst of it, but he said, as you see that you're suffering in the same way that Jesus suffered, you should be rejoicing that you're partaking with him in the same type of suffering. Now in verse or in chapter 5, in 1 Peter 5, 16, Peter is saying that I was an eyewitness of the sufferings of Christ. So in Peter's final exhortation to us, he pivots from suffering to the coming glory that is going to be revealed to the faithful ones that rejoice in it, that 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 respond to God in it, allow God to refine us and shape us because there is a glory of God that is going to be revealed in and through us. Now, let's begin the actual content of uh, studying the actual content of 1 Peter chapter 5. He talks to the elders and those that are exercising spiritual leadership and oversight. Uh, Peter's final apostolic instructions are to the leadership of the church, and that is found in verse 1, 2, and also 3 and 4. And so he tells uh, the, the shepherds, the pastors, and the elders of the church to, to shepherd God's flock willingly, that even though they are enduring suffering as well. Don't allow it to, to cause themselves to become faint-hearted where they become quitters and, and discouraged and they go, it's not worth it. But he said, no, continue to yield yourself to the calling and the role that God has assigned to you to provide oversight over the flock of God. Peter, I love this in, this in these opening verses of chapter five. He speaks from a place of pure relationship, but one with moral authority. He said, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. Now, this is a man who is one of the apostles of the Lamb. He, he is in the inner circle of the three pillars of apostleship, Peter, James, and John. That, that is the three that are the closest to Jesus. But I love how this man, instead of him, you know, pulling out the ace card, the trump card of his apostolic authority, he goes, guys, I'm also a fellow elder. I, I at a peer level, we're all on the same level and, and we're doing the work that God has called us to do among the flock of God, among the church of God. And then he says, I have a moral authority even though I view you as my peer, I have a moral authority to speak to you because I was an eyewitness of the sufferings of Jesus. And he says, I was an eyewitness and a partaker of the glory that is going to be revealed. Now, history records that during severe state persecutions, the tenure of some of these shepherd elders was less than one week. So I want you to put yourself in the, the shoes of the individuals that were the elders that Peter was addressing. And again, history records that some of these individuals that ex accepted these places of leadership and pastoring the churches in New Testament time, their life expectancy was one week. When one was removed and martyred and executed, and as others were appointed, uh, so you can imagine the weight of knowing that that when I sign up to be a spiritual leader, when I when I voluntarily accept this role in this position, that it could mean my very life. 
The next thing that Peter says, I want you to shepherd willingly the flock of God. This means that because you desire to, not because you have to. And he said, it's not for material enrichment. And he, and he encouraged them in, in their attitude towards the flock. He said, I want you to, to exercise the authority that God entrusts you when you're serving in the office of eldership, not to do it in a domineering way. But I want you to be an example of the flock. I want your lifestyle. I want your attitude. I want your conduct. I want you, the manner in which, in, in, in how you carry out your heart and how you express lifestyle Christianity among the people of God, that you're an example, that, that, that you're not doing it in a way in which you are intimidating or dominating. Now, he also talks about the rewards from the chief shepherd to these fellow elders, to these under shepherds. He says in verse four, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now, I've often joked, and, and I've been a pastor or I've been in ministry for nearly 40 years now. Excuse me, I'm gonna take a drink. And one of the things that I, in my tenure, and, and, and over the, the lifetime of ministry in which I've served the body of Christ in various places and in various roles, one of the things that it is not done for me is enrich me materially. And so I joke and say, the pay may not be great here, but the retirement is out of this world. <laughs> and literally that is so true. Peter says to these fellow elders that are facing maybe even greater hostility and persecution because they're the face of the church in leadership. He said, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. Then he shifts in verse five to addressing those that are the, the younger in the church. And it does not delineate the age, but he's probably talking about young adults, those that are adolescents and teens. And really, this is such a powerful exhortation that should be so valued and reinstated or restated in the church. It says, let the younger honor and submit to the elders. Now, the term elder can mean a person with leadership oversight in the church, but it also can mean an individual within the church that has a general status of maturity and a wisdom because of their age. Now, I want to emphasize this because I, I see that we no longer have a culture of honor within the church. It's amazing to see how children disrespect not only church leadership or they place no value on church leadership, but even the, the, the older saints of the church. We as adults and parents, and so those parents that are listening uh, to this teaching, I want you to impart the value of those by age, by wisdom, by, by their spiritual seniority based upon their walk with God and the tenure of how they have faithfully served the Lord. Instead of, instead of looking them as feeble and fragile and of, of no value to our community, I want us to celebrate uh, the senior saints of God in our midst. I want to have parents in part of vision and a value of spiritual leaders and, 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 and what they do in setting a, a spiritual temperature and a focus and, and, and a self-sacrificing lifestyle that many pastors and leaders just pour out their life on behalf of the flock of God. We should point to them as an example and say, you know what, when, when you mature and grow up, this person uh, you know, exemplifies a Christ-likeness. They, 
they, they, they are walking in a way in which they're showing the value of truth. They love God and they love others and they love truth and they're willing to lay down their life for others. They show generosity, hospitality. We should be pointing out these examples and, and allow them to have the opportunity to, to meet some of the senior saints and hear their stories, their God stories, their testament, testimonies. And so I, I just want to encourage you to teach the younger to honor the elders. Now, he gives then moving from younger in relationship to the older or to the elders. He tells them to, to, for everyone to clothe yourself, all of you with humility towards one another. No one is better than the other. No one is superior to another. We're all redeemed by his blood and we have all stood in need of the grace of God. So he says, put on humility like a garment. Clothe yourself with humility. So when we relate to each other, we're not, we're not there to judge. We're not there to inspect. We're not there to look down on anybody. We're there to serve one another. And he says that if we will clothe ourselves with humility and humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, promotion and exaltation is from the Lord. But he said that if you relate in the body to each other in an intimidating way out of an era of superiority, he said God will resist the proud, but he gives ability, favor, and grace to the humble. Now, in verse 7, he begins to talk about the transfer of, of those things that are weighty to us, those stressors, those worries, those anxieties that sometimes compound upon our shoulders and they become burdens and, and yokes about us that spiritually and emotionally exhaust us. And he gives this instruction. He said, all of you, I want you to humble yourself. I want you to walk humbly amongst each other and allow God's grace to be present among you. But then he says, I want you to transfer your worries. I want you to cast your cares on the one who can carry your cares. But ultimately, the reason why he can carry your cares is because he's caring for you. He is your primary caregiver. And so every day of our life, this is an act of faith as we see darkness in the world and as as we see things happening to us in our life that could create anxiety and worry every single day, we have to cast. And, and this is an active verb, a verb of action where we're, we're not just passively just laying it down and saying, God, would you pick it up? No, we're, it's like playing catch with God. We're saying, here, God, I'm worrying about this. Catch this. It is, it is throwing it over, rolling it over, taking the burden off of you and rolling it over onto his shoulders. Now he says be, in verse eight, be serious in your thinking and watchful. And the reason why is because we have a real and a personal adversary. He is like a roaring lion and he is seeking those that are vulnerable to attack. So he tells them, I want you to be sober in your thinking. I want you to always be watchful. We need to be spiritually prepared and be aware and discerning at all times because we know the enemy is always attempting to find some advantage, some open door, some way in which he can strike and attack us. And to be forewarned is to be forearmed. So I want to always be battle ready. I want to always be armored up. I always want to have my, my shield of faith deployed and the sword of the spirit ready for use. Now, the devil prowls, prowls seeking whom he may devour, but he also is roaring to intimidate. And, and the, the purpose of a, a lion roaring is sometimes the prey will just 
seize up in fear and intimidation. And it allows the enemy or the lion to make his final maneuver and move upon the prey in which he's trying to entrap. We need to understand that much of what the enemy does is to try to intimidate us, to create panic, to create fear and intimidation within us. Be bold and courageous. The Lord is with you. He is for you. And if you will stand your ground and not retreat, having done all to stand, stand. You are in a winning position in Christ. Stand ready uh, to repel the attack of the enemy. We are told in verse nine to resist the devil by not wavering in doubt and fear, but be firm in your faith. The enemy tries to isolate believers and attempts to shape the perception that no one else is going through what we are going through, but that is not true. Know that other believers are enduring the same kind of test and attacks. And that's why you need to be together. You need to be sharing. You need to be vulnerable because when you're vulnerable about what you're going through, somebody else is going to say, hey, I want you to know that I've also been walking through the same thing. You can pray for each other. You can share each other's burdens. You can lift each other's arms up. You can strengthen each other in the Lord by being in community, sharing our burdens with each other. Now, this is the conclusion of the letter. He says this, and after you have suffered a little while, the grace of all, the God of all grace, excuse me, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, what happens in the aftermath of a fiery trial? Peter said, God is and will be known as the God of all grace to you. He will reveal himself as the one who is the sufficient one who can restore you. He can place you firmly. Confirm means to place firmly. He, will, he is there to strengthen you. He's there to ground and found you, establish you. And so it, it is awesome to know that not only is God leading you into the battle, walking you through the wilderness, but on the other side of the fiery trial, he's there to restore you. He's there to perfect whatever needs to be completed in you. He's there to finish what he begun. He's there to confirm or place firmly, firmly place you. So whatever promises remain unfulfilled, God is there to say, I'm going to restore and to confirm you. I'm going to make you strong. If you feel like you, you, your flesh has been weakened through this and, 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 and and there have been things that the enemy has tried to inflict upon you during this trial. God says, I'm going to make you strong. Whatever is weak, I'm going to strengthen by the power of my grace. And then he says, I'm going to establish you. Whatever was insecure is going to become secured. Whatever is going to go grow, has grown weak, he's going to make strong. Whatever promises remain unfulfilled, he said, I'm going to continue to bring you into the promised inheritance of the fullness of your salvation and whatever needs to be completed or restored or made perfect. God is going to work it out for good in our lives because we love God and we're called according to his purpose. I'm going to pray for you right now and I'm going to ask that there is a revelation of the God of all grace that is revealed to you even in the moments of your fiery trials that you're walking through right now and that as you come out on the other side you'll see that he's been your restorer he has been your confirmer he's been your 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 strength and he's the one who is establishing you upon the strong foundation of his truth and his character father i thank you that we can trust and rely upon you i thank you that you are the all-sufficient one. You are the God of all grace. There is no inability uh, within your nature. There, there is no in, 
and capability within your nature. You are the almighty God. Nothing is too difficult for you. Nothing is impossible with you. And so, Father, I thank you that you have designed us for destiny in Christ. And Lord, I thank you for in the middle of our trials and our sufferings, and whether they grow more intense as we see uh, dark days that are on the horizon, I thank you, God, that you're going to be the one who restores us, confirms us, strengthens us, and establishes us in Christ Jesus. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. We love you.